Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari 8-bit games, some which I grew up with and some which are new to me. Today is one of the former. Today we're taking a look at Dr. Boris, which was a 1987 release for Atari 8-bit, programmed by Alex Dudney. It was originally published as a type-in basic listing in Atari User Volume 3 Number 6, which was the October 1987 issue, and rather boldly the magazine proclaimed it Game of the Year on the front cover of that particular magazine. It's a topical game based on an overworked doctor having to build his own hospital due to cutbacks in the NHS, and it's one of the first games I ever typed in on the Atari 8-bit. It helped me develop my own confidence in developing my own programs and tinkering with basic programs, and it's a simple game that's remained a strong favourite for many years. So, let's go play Dr. Boris. Okay, here we are with Dr. Boris from Atari User and Alex Judney. And uh, I have a small confession to make. Uh, I've just recorded a video of this, and I forgot to press record on the video capture. Um, <laughs> so I recorded a good 20 minutes or so of me talking. Um, was very satisfied with it and everything like that. Closed, uh, closed the uh, Atari program down. I need to realize that I hadn't even opened OBS in the first place. So that's good, isn't it? Anyway, anyway, you didn't need to know any of that, but that's just a glance behind the curtain. Um, so yes, if I sound like I'm sort of going through the motions at any point on here, that is why. Anyway, this is Dr. Burris. This is a game I'm very fond of. As I said in the intro, I think this is one of the first games that I typed in from a magazine, uh, specifically Atari User Magazine, and I really like it. So the concept of this game is that you play Dr. Burris, who is a newly qualified doctor who has shown up on his first day to work, only to discover, to his horror, that um, the hospital he's supposed to be working at hasn't been built yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's all down to cutbacks in the NHS, you see. So what he has to do is he has to, excuse me, help build the hospital. Stop burping. I'm drinking a lot because it's very hot here today. Um, <laughs> he has to help build the hospital. He has to defuse the unexploded bombs that are around the building site. He has to avoid the radioactive skulls that are buried around the building site. And he has to avoid the toxic skin of his supervisor, Mad Norman. Uh, so if, if Mad Norman touches you, then you will die. I mean, in most jobs, in most jobs, you want to make it so that your boss isn't touching you at the best of times, I think. But uh, it's especially true in the world of Dr. Boris. Right, let's play. So here we are. Dr. Boris is the little thing with legs in the middle. Move him around with the joystick. Pick up the bombs, which are gradually counting down. And when you've collected all the bombs, which are represented as percent signs when they're inactive, then you move on to the next level. So you'll see on the first few levels, Mad Norman, which is the other blue thing, only moves when you move. Now that changes right now, in fact, on level four. So he starts moving around by himself. He only moves diagonally, you'll notice. So, if you watch his movement patterns, you can stay out of his way quite easily. But yeah, it's, it's only if he actually moves over the same square that you're in um, that he will kill you. But as the levels get more complex with more and more bombs on them, and the timers start to go a little bit faster, you'll find it trickier and trickier to stay out of his way. Fortunately, whoops, there we go. He got me by moving over the top of me. Fortunately, as you can see, um, Dr. Boris has the means of breaking himself out of getting trapped. So if you hold down the fire button and push a direction, you will use a stick of dynamite in that direction and that will break through a single square of pretty much anything. So if you built a wall, or if there's a weed in the way, you can use the dynamite to break through, and uh, that will allow you to reach things that are otherwise inaccessible. You've got to be careful though, because you've only got a limited amount of dynamite, which is represented by the bar at the bottom of the screen. The blue marker will move to the left, 
with every stick of dynamite that you use. Oops. And if you run out of dynamite, well, you can't break through any more walls. So if you're stuck at that point, then you are screwed. So you probably want to try and use it reasonably sparingly, but as as you fill up more of the level with your bricks, sometimes you'll find yourself having to break through in various ways. <clears throat> so I really liked this game as a kid because it's it's a fun game. But also, I understood the way it was put together. It was probably written in basic. As I say, it was a typing listing. So like, like most typing listings, it was written in basic. And there's nothing super complicated going on in this game. Almost everything in this game is done with redefined coloured characters in the Atari's graphics mode 1, rather than uh, using hardware sprites or anything like that. So everything you see on the screen here is a text character that has been redefined to look like something different. And then by displaying them in the Atari's graphics mode 1, you're able to print them in one of four colours to the screen. And that is enough to make a straightforward and fairly simple looking game. I think the only exception to that is the, um, the marker on the dynamite bar down at the bottom which is if i remember correctly that is one of the atari's hardware sprites and the reason that's being used is so that it can be put on the screen independently of the uh the gauge graphic because the, the nice thing about the atari's hardware sprites or players as they're known is that they're pretty much completely independent to the rest of the screen. So they don't have to match the resolution of the graphics mode you're using. They don't have to, I don't think they have to use the same colours even. Um, and they certainly don't interfere with the background, which is the, the, the really nice thing. So in this instance, it made a lot of sense to use it for an interface element rather than an actual player sprite. Simply because because the design of the game meant that using character graphics for everything was efficient enough for the design of the game. But the nice thing about that is because although you could call the Atari's hardware sprites from basic, it was a lot more complicated than just dealing with text characters. Oh, I had dynamite. I so say what that's what made this game fun to fiddle around with for me is because I understood what it was doing with the redefined text characters and thus I was able to add my own customizations to it. So I fiddled around with how some of the things were presented. I changed some of the text on the screen. I changed how information was displayed. I swapped the Dr. Boris and the Mad Norman character around because I felt the Mad Norman graphic better represented a panicked doctor uh, than whatever the head with legs you are was. And I also felt confident and empowered enough to add my own bits to the game as well. Oh, I'm out of bloody dynamite again. Um, so this game doesn't have a high score for Simpsy, for example. But because I'd looked at some other listings and seen how high score systems were implemented, I felt confident enough to be able to add that to this program. Because a, a high score system in a basic game is very, very simple. You just need a variable that includes um, the high score. And when the end of the game comes, all you do is you compare the player's current score to the value in the high score variable. 
And if the current score is bigger than the high score, then you reset the high score variable so that it is the same as the current score. And if you're feeling really clever, you could then use Atari Basics built-in input-output functions to save that high score to disk and then load it in every time you played the game. I didn't go that far, but I do remember adding my own high score routine to this game. Just because I really like this game and I really enjoyed programming in BASIC, I just wanted to fiddle around with this. And that was the really nice thing about typing listings. They weren't printed as something for the author to get precious about. They were printed as something to learn from. And this was kind of handled in different ways according to the various magazines that were on the market at the time. So Page 6 Magazine and Atari User, which were the two main UK-based Atari 8-bit magazines, um, Atari User, which this was published in, tended to print a full listing, but they would also include things like um, a breakdown of the program, so it was saying which line numbers in the program were doing what things, and uh, what the different variables represented, and all that sort of thing. And using that information, you could then figure out how to make your own changes to the program. Page 6, meanwhile, took a slightly different approach, which was more that... Um, rather than providing an elaborate backstory to the software, as was often the case in Atari user, um, most Page 6 contributors who were putting out um, type... No! Who were putting out typing listings, they tended to write a full-on article to go with their program that would explain what the program was doing, what you could learn from it, and in fact, giving some suggestions as to what you might want to change about the program if you're going to tinker with it yourself. Now you'll notice the colours have started cycling. Um, this is the Atari 8-bits Attract mode, which kicks in after a certain amount of time has passed and cycles around all the colours on the screen. Uh, as an attempt to prevent stuff getting burned into your display. So, as you as you probably know, the standard for displays at the time was to use a CRT monitor or a TV. And if you leave a static image on those for too long, it will get burnt into the screen. You can still see it on certain old checkouts in stores and um, cash point machines and that sort of thing. So what the Atari did is it has a little internal counter at a particular location in memory that gradually counts up while there are no keyboard inputs and it's specifically keyboard inputs. It doesn't... Uh oh It's specifically keyboard inputs, not joystick inputs. And when that reaches a certain value, it starts doing this attract mode. Now, obviously, when you're playing a game that is entirely joystick-based, like Dr. Burris here, you don't necessarily want that to happen. I mean, it's fun to see the different colours and stuff like we're seeing here. But chances are you pick the game's colour palette with a particular reason. Because you like the way it looked. And so what you can do... is you can use the poke command... to basically reset that internal timer... as if you'd pressed a key. Now it seems that Alex Judney here forgot to do that. Oops! Um, and so we end up with the attract mode. So actually making sure that that timer is reset on a regular basis is a very easy thing to forget. You can see some commercial software authors forgetting to do it sometimes. And the reason it's a bit of a pain is you, you can't turn that internal, internal timer off altogether. What you have to do is just keep resetting it on a regular basis. So normally the way you would implement that is that you would put um, a command into the game's main loop. So the part of the program that just continuously executes. So in this case it would be whatever is reading the joystick. Um, and every time that loop comes around, 
it would reset that internal timer. So it never gets to the value needed to trigger the attract mode. And so fixing the attract mode problem in this would be very simple. You just need to find the main loop, which would be conveniently listed for you in Atari user. And then just put that simple poke command in. Now, I've talked about um, Atari user and Page 6 magazine already. Over in the US, they had Antic and Analog magazine. And there was, that, there was quite a lot of cross-pollination between the two sides of the pond, for obvious reasons. But Analog in particular distinguished itself by um, posting the majority of its stuff as machine code games. Which meant that it was quite a bit harder to learn stuff from them. But the games were, on average, very high quality. Sort of pretty much commercial quality in a lot of cases. And as a sort of acknowledgement that people liked to type in listings as a means of learning how to program things, Analog would tend to list its machine code programs in two formats. It would provide the, the hexadecimal format which you would type in in BASIC, and that would then create an executable file on a floppy disk or a um, cassette tape, which is how most people would type it in. Um, but they would also provide the assembly language listing as well, which in most cases is what the author of the program would have written the, the machine code game in. Now, unlike BASIC, not everyone had access to assembly language because you needed a an assembler to be able to make use of that and so it was very much a sort of subset of people who would learn stuff from machine language listings but you could still learn from them if you were dedicated enough and i'm sure there were plenty of people out there who learned plenty of things from typing in assembly language listings in analog And then Antic Magazine, it's, it's been a very long time since I've read a copy of Antic, actually, but from what I remember, it was similar to Page 6 and Atari user's approach, which is that the typing listings would be provided in such a way as to help you learn. They were designed to sort of help you develop your confidence and a feeling of empowerment to be able to customise them for your own purposes. That, that's the beauty of basic and that's what the b in basic stands for is, is beginners so it's designed to be easy to learn you can do some very complex things in basic particularly atari basic but at its core it is a a programming language for beginners and that means once you get a decent understanding of the the syntax and how you make various things happen on the screen or in the computer's memory it's quite straightforward to be able to both write your own programs and to fiddle around with other people's programs And as I say, this is a relatively simple piece of no. This is a relatively simple piece of software compared to some other stuff that I've played. But that, for me, was what made it appealing. Right, specifically because the structure and the functionality of this program was so straightforward. I found it easy to, to look at the program listing and think, okay, so that bit does that. So if I change this little bit to do this instead, then this is what will happen. And sometimes that would work and sometimes it wouldn't work. 
but you'd learn things in both situations. So if it didn't work, you'd have to figure out why it didn't work. Oh, damn it. And then you could learn something from that. And if it did work, you could then think, right, okay, I'll remember how to do that in the future. And like I say, this this for me was was that program. That program that gave me the enthusiasm to explore computing from, in a more detailed level for myself, to take it beyond just typing in and playing games into sort of experimenting with things for myself, trying to create my own things. I mean, nothing I did in that regard really amounted to very much. Like, I remember making one complete basic program in my time with the Atari 8-bit, but I started on a lot of a lot of different projects, and it was, it was by looking at stuff like this that I learned how to do a lot of things. So while I may not have... While I may not have finished a lot of those projects, I learned a lot of things along the way. And had I been so in so inclined, which apparently I wasn't, had I been so inclined, I could have taken that a bit further and started to do other things. But I think even though I didn't finish any of those projects, I think it was still helpful for me because it helped to help to develop my own skills of um, being inquisitive and uh, looking at things and analysing them and learning about them. And I think the fact that I tend to play games these days with such an analytical eye to them, even if I don't necessarily understand how the programming was put together. I think a big part of, of, of how I can look at games in such an analytical way today is because I spent a fair, a fair part of the early portion of my life picking apart these basic listings and fiddling around with them. So yes, thank you Alex Judney for this game. It was very important to me, still is very important to me. And thank you Atari user for publishing it. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.